Do you want the, uh, uh, the left wing of the Washington establishment or do you want the right wing of the Washington establishment? And I realized the problem is the Washington establishment and we need a restoration of our Constitution. What was that moment when you realized that you were a Liberty Republican? I like to say to folks that there's there's two kinds of libertarians. So the kind of libertarians who are the people who are always kind of the rebels, you know, as kids who always rebelled against authority and and questioned authority. Uh, and I'm ashamed to say that's not <laughs> that's not how I began. I was actually I was I was the goody two shoes in class. I was the teacher's pet, and I I trust authority. And you know what? I grew up in a family where Fox News was always on the TV, uh, Rush Limbaugh was always on the radio. And I, uh, I remember as a high school student, you know, we went into Iraq. I was cheering. I thought it was a great thing. I thought we were going in, we were sold that we were going in as liberators for these oppressed people overthrowing an oppressive regime. And I thought, you know, this is a very great, noble way to use our U.S. military to go and try to make the world safe for democracy, as Woodrow Wilson, you know, once, once told us. It wasn't until many years later, as I was, you know, cheerleading for, uh, for the president at the time, George W. Bush, it wasn't until uh, my, my oldest brother, Matt, was a big Ron Paul supporter in 2008, and he told me I was stupid. <laughs> you know, uh, and he kept be beating me over the head with Ron Paul. In fact, he uh, uh, he he wasn't very nice about it all the time. And maybe maybe he'd been nicer. Maybe I would have uh, listened sooner. But it wasn't until 2010, the Tea Party wave, as I was uh, getting ready to graduate from college. At the time, of course, the big concern was this huge number of our national debt, 13 trillion dollars. Of course, these days, we fondly look back on that as the good old days. It's almost a rounding error. <laughs> it's almost a rounding error. And now we're up to $21 trillion, which doesn't even account for the 13, $113 trillion of unfunded liabilities. You know, that's a, when you take that out and you divide that out across America, it's a million dollars for every single American taxpayer. But I was concerned about that at the time as a millennial, as someone who realized, you know, this is going to be my generation that is paying this off. Uh, for the rest of our lives, and I realized after the, the, the bank bailouts that this wasn't just something that the Democrats had done to us, this was something that the Republicans had done to us too. This was the, the, the two wings of the Washington establishment doing this to us, and this illusion of choice we were given every few years. Do you want the, uh, uh, the left wing of the Washington establishment, or do you want the right wing of the Washington establishment? And I realized the problem is the Washington establishment, and we need a restoration of our Constitution. And that's uh, in the Tea Party wave. I read Ron Paul's book, The Revolution. I ended up going in hook, hook line, and sinker and, and really realizing that I've been lied to throughout my life. I've been lied to by Washington, and the American people have been lied to. And so uh, when I graduated from college, I ended up in New York City. I was working as a professional actor there. I had my BFA in, in acting and theater. That's actually what I intended to do, what I loved and planned to do for the rest of my life. But I got involved with a local grassroots Ron Paul effort there just started showing up to debate watch parties. People started noticing that I kept showing up and asked me, hey, you know, uh, would you come out tabling with us in Union Square? Or would you make this flyer to promote an event we're doing? And yeah, I took these small responsibilities, did a good job with it. And of course, when you do a good job with small things, they end up giving you bigger things. Before I knew it, I was, run I was running the whole organization. And that led to a job offer with the Ron Paul campaign. But a lot of the issues that animate you as a state senator strike me as, as issues that, that, that could, in fact, grow the Republican coalition. Um, everything from criminal justice to medical cannabis. Talk about some of the successes you've had as a legislator. Well, of course, two years after the Ron Paul campaign, I ran for state senate. I ran for state senate against a guy who'd been in elected office for 36 years, never lost a race. I was 26 years old. People told me I had no chance. The establishment tried to run people against me in the primary but just went out, knocked on thousands of doors, and with the help of the Liberty Movement, we won that race in a in a close to 20-point landslide. And I went into Augusta, I, uh, one of the first things I did was I sponsored and we passed constitutional carry in the state of Maine. We were the sixth state to pass that. And we passed that uh, while Democrats were actually in control of the House of Representatives. And it's because, um, I, you know, as someone with kind of the Liberty message, I find that I can communicate a lot with people on both sides of the aisle because there's something in liberty for everyone. Everyone has something that they want government to leave them alone on. Now, the left likes to talk about 
government you know, leaving us alone when it comes to what happens in our bedroom, what happens in our green room, civil liberties, privacy rights. So, I don't know, with the level that they seem to be trusting, you know, <laughs> some of these uh, spy agencies we're these days. We're losing some of that. We're losing yeah. some of that. I think... On, on both sides, though. Sa sadly, yeah. I think that's, that's the sad thing about partisanship these days is we are, um, when we lose principle to partisanship, when we, when we say, well, the thing I was concerned about Barack Obama doing, I'm now completely okay with because it's Donald Trump doing it, or vice versa. We see it on both sides. You know, the anti-war left, what happened to them when Barack Obama became president? They disappeared. Uh, and, and suddenly, for the first time, we were able to get Republicans <laughs> to be skeptical of some of these wars that Obama was putting us into. Yeah. Yeah. Talk a little bit about uh, criminal justice and, and medical cannabis. You, you've passed some of these things in Maine. Yeah. Now, Maine, of course, uh, Maine is, has one of the longest standing medical cannabis programs in the country. We were the second state after California to pass medical cannabis. And I've been the Senate chairman for the Health and Human Services Committee the last, the last four years. And I'll tell you, when I, when I came in kind of from a libertarian perspective, I Truth be told, I thought that medical cannabis was, you know, people should be able to do what they want in their own life. It's, it's none of the government's business, so people want to use medical cannabis and say it's medicine, okay, whatever. But I was actually really skeptical that I thought it was just a, um, uh, just a stepping stone to getting to kind of adult use legalization. But I really began to meet some of these people, you know, veterans coming home from the wars with, with PTSD. Uh, young, young children, young girls with severe epilepsy disorders, uh, people with cancer, people who's, whose lives really had been changed for the better because of access to this plant as a medicine that our federal government has thrown people in cages for decades for using. When I saw that, when I really became, began to appreciate just how profound and, and impactful this was for people who were really struggling with, with, with serious conditions, uh, I, I I wanted to do what I could to help, you know. I've sponsored a lot of medical cannabis policy over the years, pa passed uh, many things. But the biggest thing we just passed, we just passed a, a whole overhaul of the medical cannabis program, which uh, creates more choice and flexibility for patients and legal businesses, uh, allows doctors to, to recommend medical cannabis for any condition at all that they feel would be beneficial versus uh, what most states have, what Maine has had, is an arbitrary list of conditions. It's on this list or it's not, and if it's not on that list, you're not allowed to have access. We've been changing that, we've been getting more freedom in Maine. I mean, I view it as a subset of this broader issue that you've worked on, right to try. Yes. The ability of patients and doctors to make decisions without some government dictating, this is the list of things you can and can't do. That seems so fundamental. Right, I mean, th this is what we're founded on. We're a free country, right? I mean, that's what our founders fought a revolution to, to secure for us and overthrew the rule of, of, of the king. Uh, they didn't want Washington, D.C. to become the king over our lives. They wanted us to be free and to make our own choices in our own lives. That's the beauty of, of, of natural rights, you know, our, our rights to life, liberty, and property. I can make my own choices in my own life, and if I'm not harming you uh, against your will, then, uh, then I've got the right to make that choice. And when it comes to our choices in our own health care, the idea that you have a terminally ill patient, someone with six months to live, they've exhausted all the FDA approved treatments, there's nothing left that they can try, except that there is a, a, a treatment going through the, the FDA approval process, and it might not be on the market for 10 years because that's how long it takes. Well, if you only have six months to live, you can't wait 10 years. Now the federal government would say, well, you know, too bad, it's for your own good. We have to protect you from your own choices for your own good. Well, how is it really for your own good if, if you're gonna die? You know, worst case scenario, it, it, you try something, it doesn't work, maybe it does harm to you. But if you're already dying, like that should be your, your right to make that choice yourself. If people are skeptical about what a libertarian Republican stands for, give us that, give us that quick pitch. What is, yeah. what is a liber libertarian Republican? <laughs> Well, there's a certain book I read where someone summed it up very well, which is uh, don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. That's, that, that, that works pretty well for me. I think it all boils down to this. You know, everyone wants to be, everyone wants to be free to make their own choices in their own lives. The problem is we don't always want other people to be free to make their own choices in their own lives. But if we want that freedom for ourselves, we need to respect and tolerate other people's choices. You know, I always argue on the floor of the Maine Senate, uh, freedom is the right to make stupid choices. If you only have the right to make good choices, well then the question is, who gets to decide what the good choices are? The government? Now, I don't think the government has a very good track record of you know, determining what the good, good, good policies are. And government is pretty incompetent most of the time. We need to be free to make our own choices, whether that's you know, 
if I choose to use cannabis, if I choose to, what personal relationships I choose to engage with people in my personal life, uh, your personal life, that's, that should be my choice. That's what's living in a free country. And the only force we should use against others is the force of persuasion.